Hello everyone. In the previous video, you have got a glimpse of what cognitive hypnotic psychotherapy is. Since a large part of this course revolves around hypnosis and NLP, let us understand how the two fields are related. The best way to do so is by looking at their history. Starting with hypnosis first. The word hypnotism was coined by James Brett in 1841. While he was trying to provide a rational explanation to the phenomena of mesmerism. I'm sure you've heard of this term before, in expressions like, I was so mesmerized by her beauty that I could have done anything she wanted me to do. The term mesmerism is derived from a person named Franz Anton Mesmer, who was a physician from Austria. He would heal people by using certain rituals including magnets, music, hand gestures and suggestions. When people would go to him with certain problems like aches and pains, he would follow these rituals, say a few words and their pain would just go away. On being asked how he was able to do what he was doing, he said all animals have a magnetic healing power which they use to heal themselves and that he had the same power with which he was able to heal others. He used the expression animal magnetism to describe this healing power. Given that his explanation was not so rational and his use of rituals, people started believing that he was into witchcraft and black magic, which became the primary reason for his downfall. That said, no matter how irrational the explanations were, the fact that mesmerism showed result meant there were others who started experimenting with the same. Certain medical practitioners were looking at ways to conduct painless surgeries especially because chemical anesthesia had its own side effects and was not yet available to most. Since mesmerism seemed to provide the desired results, many physicians like John Elliotson in Britain and James Hesdale in India carried out complex surgeries including amputation of limbs using mesmerism as the sole anesthesia. It was around this time, in early 1840s, that James Brett became intrigued by mesmerism. He completely opposed the concept of animal magnetism and believed that the phenomena of mesmerism could be explained by established laws of physiology and psychology. With the objective to demystify mesmerism, he conducted a series of experiments. His initial observations from these experiments was that as a result of the rituals that these mesmerists were using, nerves in a part of the subject's mind were going to sleep, thereby creating what he believed to be a state of hypersuggestivity. It was as a result of this understanding that he coined the term neurohypnotism, meaning sleep of nerves. He further observed that the same state can be achieved without using these rituals by using alternate methods like focusing and concentrating on a particular point or an object or even bed. Later, he dropped neuro and started using the word hypnotism. Soon he realized that the phenomena he was trying to explain was not a kind of a sleep and hence he tried changing the name to monoidism which means focus on a singular thought or an idea. But by then, the word hypnotism and its variation hypnosis had already caught on. Brett later gave a more elaborate explanation in which he mentioned that in a hypnotic state, one or more senses become hypersensitive. The subject is in a state of hypersuggestibility and that the behavior of the subject is determined by the suggestions given to him or her. Let us break this definition to understand it better. One or more senses become hypersensitive. The five basic senses we have are touch, taste, sight, smell, and hearing. In a hypnotic state, one or more of these senses heighten. So, right now, you may not be able to hear the sounds coming from outside the room you are in. But, in a hypnotic state, if it was your hearing sense that heightens, you may be able to hear the sounds from outside the room. Or, if your visual sense becomes hypersensitive, it would become easier for you to visualize things more clearly. Some people find it difficult to get in touch with their emotions, but in a hypnotic state, 
they notice themselves getting in touch with their sensations and emotions a lot more easily. Now, this is contrary to popular perception that people don't see, hear, feel anything in a hypnotic state. The state in which people don't see, hear, feel anything is called death. And I'm sure I don't want my clients to reach there, not at least because of me. In this explanation, Brett also talks about hypersuggestible state. This means that a person is in a more receptive state to accept suggestions, which would lead to a change in the person's automatic behavior. We will talk about hypersuggestible state and automatic behavior in detail later on. Finally, the behavior of the subject is determined by suggestions given to him or her. Now, this means not only the behavior while the subject is in a hypnotic state, but also the behavior after the subject comes out of the hypnotic state. For example, somebody has a fear of public speaking. She states that as I walk closer to the stage, a sense of nervousness creeps in and that I would like to feel relaxed and confident instead of nervous. I can guide her into a hypnotic state and give her a suggestion to imagine that as you start walking towards the stage, you will feel a sense of relaxation. And then, as you step onto the stage, you begin to experience that every cell of your body is vibrating with confidence. This confidence helps you deliver the speech you've prepared naturally and effectively. Will the client experience this in a hypnotic state? Yes, as it is an imaginative state. But does that resolve her problem? Well, not necessarily. Not unless, in her real life, when she approaches the stage, the experience of a wave of relaxation happens naturally. And then, when she steps on the stage, that confidence in every cell of her body is experienced automatically. If this happens, then her problem would be resolved, wouldn't it? All therapies in hypnosis are a result of this phenomenon, that the results of the suggestions given in a hypnotic state are experienced by the client not only while the client is in a hypnotic state, but also after the client comes out of the hypnotic state. After this rational explanation of hypnosis by Brett, there was a rise in popularity of hypnosis. It was used extensively during World War I and World War II in order to deal with post-war trauma. However, after World War II, there was a dip in popularity of hypnosis. Now, why was there a dip? Remember, people used hypnosis for many years, even without a proper explanation because it gave results. The reasons why there is a dip in popularity of any field is because it stops giving us the result especially the ones that we are looking for. So after World War II, hypnotists observed that around 50% of people were not going in a hypnotic state. Now, if two or three clients out of 100 do not get hypnotized, I guess that's ignorable. But if 50 or 60 clients out of 100 are not getting hypnotized, then it gets a little tricky. This made people believe that not everyone can get hypnotized. And sadly, this is a myth that people still believe in. Why do I say this is a myth? Because around the same time, there was a physician in California by the name of Milton Erickson, who was able to hypnotize people who were not getting hypnotized prior to this. Not only this, he was able to get results in few sessions with clients that others were not able to get even in years. His results were so remarkable and were so unique that the American Psychology Association even tried to revoke his license. If you can find some of his videos, you will realize how good he was because even while watching those videos and listening to his voice, you go into a hypnotic trance. We start focusing on Ericksonian model of hypnosis, which is also known as conversational hypnosis from level 2 onwards. You will begin with practical exercises to learn to observe your clients more effectively and then create your own scripts based on observations about the client and the principles of Ericksonian style of hypnosis. The next important figure that we talk about is John Kabat. 
A lot of models we cover in this level originated from his work. He began by researching on the contradiction that on one hand, most of the hypnotists were finding it difficult to induce hypnotic states in their subjects. And on the other hand, there was Erickson and some others who were able to induce a hypnotic state in people almost at will. After his research, he concluded that it is not that some people cannot be hypnotized. It's just that different types of people are receptive to different types of suggestion. It is not that people cannot be hypnotized. It is just that one needs a different type of process to hypnotize different types of people. He further stated that we can predominantly divide people into categories based on their suggestibility. That is, how they receive and interpret information. These are literal and inferential. For example, if someone was to ask me, may I know your name? My reply would be, my name is Mithun Shah. If I were to ask you the same question, what would your answer be? Most of you will answer by saying your name, wouldn't you? But what was my question? It wasn't what is your name, it was May I know your name? What should ideally be the answer to this question? Yes or no? So why do we answer with our names? Because when we hear the question, our mind quickly infers that the other person wants to know our name. And so we answer with our name. This is called being inferential. A very high literal would simply hear the question for what it is and answer by saying yes or no. That said, this is just a basic example to explain what Kappas meant. In real life, most of us are really not that literal. We all are a mixture of two. It is just that the degrees would vary. A more routine example of this is when you tell someone you are looking good today. In some cases, even if you are being sarcastic, the other person may not understand the sarcasm and says, thank you. This may irritate you a lot, but that is a separate story altogether. The person said thank you because they took what you said literally. On the other hand, in some cases, you may genuinely tell someone how good he or she looks. And the person may respond by saying, what do you want? Why are you being so nice to me? Now, the response is not based on what you said, but it is based on their inference that you need something and therefore you said what you said. In other words, the listener is trying to read between lines. This is an example of being inferential. Kappas said that for literal people, we can give direct suggestion. But for inferential people, one needs to give a lot more indirect suggestion. Most hypnotists around this time were using direct suggestions with their clients. So for example, a subject would be asked to sit on a chair and would be given a suggestion like, as you sit on this chair and close your eyes, relax yourself. You are now going deeper and deeper in a hypnotic trance. If the subject was a literal, this would work very well. As the subject will take things at face value, they can simply listen to the hypnotist and go into a trance. However, when the suggestions are given to an inferential, as the inferential hears the suggestion, you are going deeper and deeper in a hypnotic trance. Instead of following the suggestion, they infer and question, how do you know? Because they are questioning the suggestion, it just doesn't work. And the hypnotist feels that the subject is not hypnotizable. The reason why Erickson was so successful was because he would generally not suggest anything directly and use indirect suggestions at most times, especially with those who are inferential. For example, instead of saying you are going deeper and deeper in a hypnotic trance, he would say, like most people, you may sooner or later experience yourself going in a hypnotic trance. Did you notice how using the words most people may sooner or later experience gives the listener a feeling that this may happen now or after some time 
and reduces the scope of inferential questioning on part of the listener, thereby increasing the chances of suggestions being accepted. To summarize, Cap has concluded that everyone can be hypnotized, provided the hypnotist is willing to use different styles of suggestions depending upon the suggestibility of the subject. Subjects were not getting hypnotized not because they were not hypnotizable, but because the hypnotist was not using the appropriate suggestion. Suggestibility is a very important topic, not only from the perspective of hypnosis, but also in terms of how we communicate in our day-to-day -day life. And hence, we would be discussing this in detail during our classroom session. While Kappus was doing his research, there was someone by the name of Richard Bandler who developed keen interest in the area of human behavior. Bandler's background was in mathematics and computer science. He joined the University of California for his bachelor's in philosophy and psychology. His professor Robert Spitzer asked him to write transcripts of Fritz Perl's work. Who was Fritz Perl? Frederick Perl was the founder of Gestalt Therapy. And what is Gestalt Therapy? It is an experiential form of psychotherapy with primary principle being whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This states that it is important to look at the whole picture than just focusing on one element of the problem. Bandler would model Fritz so well that according to Spitzer, Bandler came out of it talking and acting like Fritz Perls. What is interesting is that Bandler's modeling of Fritz was not just limited to talking and acting, but also the way he took therapy and more importantly, the results he was getting. Bandler was also asked to transcript the cases of another well-known therapist, Virginia Sackett. Virginia was a practitioner of family therapy. Family therapy is based on the idea that a problem is not due to a person, but due to the overall system that the person is a part of. And to resolve a problem, it is important to work with the system and not just the individual. Bandler noticed that though the techniques used by Virginia were different from the ones used by Fritz, their approach towards therapy was similar. He also noticed that Virginia's success to a large extent was a result of her ability to ask the right question at the right time to collect the required information in a way that a client will not be able to get into long stories and loops. Why was this important? It was important because this is one of the most common problems that most therapists face. There are times when a client comes for a therapy and starts talking about his or her problem and then they keep going on and on and on. After a couple of hours of interview, the therapist realizes that he has collected a lot of information, but none of that information is useful in terms of the therapy. Virginia's questioning style was very effective in resolving this problem. Bandler asked Virginia on how she knows what questions to ask. And she answered by saying, I know it intuitively. This was a problem. As how does one learn intuition? So Bandler decided to go through the transcripts again to check if he could identify a pattern that Virginia was following unconsciously. The reason was that once he identifies the pattern, he can master the patterns and use them to achieve desired results. So Bandler observed her work and found out that she used seven patterns of questions. When he told her about these seven patterns, Virginia apparently replied, she was aware of four of these patterns and has become aware of the other three now. As Bandler identified the patterns of questions, he understood that language is a very powerful tool to create change in unconscious behavior. In order to use this tool effectively and create models out of it, it was important to understand how language and behavior are connected to one another. In order to understand this, Bandler is supposed to have approached John Grinder, who was a linguist and professor in University of California. What do linguists do? 
they study the effect of language on behavior and vice versa. This is the technique of what we now know as neuro-linguistic programming. After this, Bandler and Grindler created what they called as the metamodern. Out of Fritz Perls, Virginia Satir, and certain other people's work and published it as a part of a two-volume book titled Structures of Man. The book revolves around the patterns of questions that can be asked during conversations to collect specific and relevant information. This is one of the best books to read to understand how intrinsically language and behavior are connected to one another. We will be covering metamodel extensively in our lectures. With further research, they found the diagnosis of a problem and creating a change are completely different. They realized that Fritz and Virginia use language patterns for diagnosis very well. However, to create a change, Fritz used a lot of imagination. Imagination is extensively used in hypnosis. Thus, they became interested in hypnosis. It is believed that at some point, Gregory Bettison, who happened to be Grindler's mentor, had suggested that they study with Milton Erickson. Bandler and Grindler approached Erickson, who was kind enough to let Bandler and Grindler observe his work. Both Bandler and Grindler were amazed at Erickson's ability to use language patterns effectively to not only collect information, but to actually create desired change in the client's behavior. From this point on, Erickson's work, in other words, hypnosis, influenced Bandler's and Grinder's work extensively. In fact, all change models in NLP are based on hypnosis, and it is for this reason that we feel the two go together very well, and the two together are a very potent combination. The way we look at it, a lot of models in NLP is what we call as applied hypnosis. Based on what they observed about Erickson's work, they created another model popularly known as Hypnotic Language Patterns of Milton Erickson, which was later converted in a book with the same title. The question that is often asked is, if hypnosis has influenced NLP so much, why just not call it hypnosis? Why give it another name? The answer is that it was around the time that Bandler and Grinder were working with Erickson that the American Psychology Association tried to revoke Erickson's license. In our understanding, this led Bandler and Grinder to believe that presenting what they are doing as an offshoot of hypnosis had a potential to get them banned as well. On top of it, one of the first techniques that they created based on Erickson's work was called reframing. They went to mental hospitals asking psychiatrists to send them clients for therapy. Psychiatrists responded by saying that these patients have mental disorders and we don't allow hypnosis to be used with them. Bandler and Grindler replied that they were not going to use hypnosis, but a new technique called reframing that they've created. Apparently, the same psychiatrists send them clients in large numbers. This may have further convinced them that the problem was not the process of hypnosis because most people opposing it did not even know what hypnosis really is. The problem was the term hypnosis and hence it made sense to call it something different. Thus, while giving a lot of credit to Erickson and how his work influenced NLP, there was never an open endorsement for hypnosis for a long time. It was only later that Bandler felt that the world is now ready to embrace hypnosis that he started talking about hypnosis and coined the term neurohypnotic repatterning. Again, in our understanding, this was also the reason why NLP, despite of being so effective, was never really accepted by psychotherapists. As most psychotherapists have a need to know why and how a process is working. By trying to present NLP as separate from hypnosis, given that most NLP change processes are based on hypnosis, they could never provide this answer. They were only able to provide these processes as working models without the required explanation 
behind how they work. Though psychotherapists were not convinced without the required explanation, it was the corporate field that took up the field with open arms as they were more interested in trainings that would lead to higher efficiency and increased revenue without really being concerned about why the processes covered in the training programs were working. Why did they call their work neuro-linguistic programming? There are different stories about why neuro-linguistic programming, but none of that can be confirmed. The one that we like the most is that Bandler was once pulled over by a policeman who asked him about his work. In the vehicle that Bandler was driving, there were three books. One each on neurology, linguistics, and computer programming. So looking at the books, Bandler coined the term neuro-linguistic programming. Also, there was never an official definition of NLP. According to Bandler, whatever he did was NLP. However, he did mention that NLP is a model of human behavior. Since this definition doesn't tell us much about NLP, most training institutes have devised their own explanations of what NLP is. The following is our version of the explanation. Neuro refers to neurons. Neurons are chemicals triggered in our body. These chemicals are responsible for our emotional state. So when I feel angry, I feel so because of the chemicals being released in my brain. Similarly, when I feel happy, I feel so because of other chemicals being released in my brain. In fact, each emotional state is connected to some or the other chemical being released in the body. So the next time you hear someone saying, love is nothing but a chemical locha, remember they are not being completely wrong. Moving forward to linguistic, linguistic refers to language. By language, we don't just mean English, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, but any other language we use to communicate with others and with self. This can include body language, tone, images, and even silence. So let's say, in order to remember God, I see God's image in my mind. This image is also an example of a language. Programming refers to the connection between language and neurons. For example, when I see one of my colleagues who did something wrong to me in the past, I feel angry. I don't even have to think of what he had done. Just his image triggers the chemical. This anger is almost instantaneous and automatic. This automatic process that triggers the emotions as a result of its association with the language is what programming refers to. Now that you know about hypnosis and NLP, let's quickly understand why we have included elements of cognitive therapy in this course. In our experience, hypnosis is a very effective change process, provided the client is willing and is clear about the change he or she is looking for. When the client is not willing, Cognitive work can help the client understand why the change is important, thereby creating a willingness for change. In case the client is willing but is not clear about what is the change that they are looking for, cognitive work can help them define the change more clearly and precisely. Once this is done, the actual change can be created quickly and effectively using hypnosis. With this, we come to the end of this video. If you would like to know more about the history, feel free to access the links given below. Thank you.